What I like to do is we begin to serve today. So I can invite you to open your palms and, uh, and, and ask uh, for the Holy Spirit to come. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to come and bless us today. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this room, fill this place. Fill our hearts, Lord. Help us to hear from you today. Burdens and worries and anxieties that we have, Lord, help us to lay those down. And may we know, Lord, that you will take them from us. And now, Lord, I pray that you'll speak through me some of the words of your goodness and your love and your mercy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We live uh, right now, it seems like, in a this or that world. You have, to do th- you have to be for this, and if you're for this, that means you're against that. And if you're for that, that means you can't be for this, right? Uh, that's just kind of how we are wired right now. Think about uh, UVA and Virginia Tech. If you like Virginia Tech, uh, you can't like UVA, right? And if you like UVA, you can't like Virginia Tech. It's just the way that it is. Uh, you know, um, when I was in college, uh, it was uh, uh, Stone Temple Pilots or Pearl Jam. Uh, you know, it, you had to pick one band or the other. And obviously, Stone Temple Pilots was the better band. Amen. Yes, I got a few claps on that. Uh, but you had to be one or the other. Nowadays, it's, uh, you got to be for a Taylor Swift or, a, or Kanye West, right? Uh, and uh, you're, what? Did I mess up? Oh, yeah, you got to be for one of those two, right? Uh, you know, you, you, are you on team Taylor Swift or you're on team uh, Kanye West? Which team are you going to be for? Uh, then uh, you got dogs and cats, right? Uh, you got the people that love cats and people that love dogs. And, uh, and most of us don't like both of them, but we have our, prof- or we have our preference, right? We like one or the other. Uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, you know, uh, if you're a Republican, you can't like the Democrats, and if you're a Democrat, you can't like the Republicans. Uh, and it, it just goes on and on. And what I want us to think about today is instead of having to pick this or that, why can't we choose both? Why can't we choose both? Why can't we enjoy the depressing music of Pearl Jam along with Stone Temple Pilots, right? Yeah, uh, just kidding. I love Pearl Jam, too. Uh, they're great. But why can't we love Kanye West and Taylor Swift? And why can't we love cats and dogs, right? We should be able to do both and not just have to do one. And the reason that I bring this up is that we're in week three of our series, What Would Jesus Say? And this week we're looking at what would Jesus say about the relationship between science and faith. And over the years, uh, this has been a divisive issue uh, and that people think you can either be team science or you can be team faith, but you can't be both. <laughs> A uh, middle school science teacher uh, sent me this in an email. This is what he said. He says, I have so many kids come to me over the years asking how faith and science can be reconciled. So many churches provide kids the false economy of you can pick science or you can pick the Bible, but you can't have both. Baloney, he says. That was my own story, and I've spent years, years trying to reconcile the two. And so what... This is what I want to kind of break down today. There are two narratives, and I want to kind of break down these narratives and tell you what I believe is the true narrative. One narrative is this. Christianity, at its core, is anti-science. And that if you ascribe to what the Bible teaches, you believe in Jesus, you can't uh, trust or have uh, faith, if you will, in science. The other narrative uh, is science, at its core, is anti-faith. Science is about facts, and if you're all about the facts and about these things, then you can't have faith. It just doesn't work that way. And what I would say about both these is I would say, I would say that these are two false narratives. And if you were to ask me, what would Jesus say about the relationship between faith and science? This is what I think Jesus would say. This is what I would say. It's a true narrative. Science doesn't disprove our faith in God. Science actually points toward God. Science points toward God. Listen to what some of the the greatest minds in science have said. Uh, Francis Collins, who who wrote a book called The Language of God, uh, he's the guy that directed the Human Genome Project and recently retired uh, from directing NIH. Uh, This is what he says. uh, Science is the language of God. Isn't that like a cool thing to think about? Science is is the, the language of God. 
Uh, Kepler said, and uh, Kepler was alive a long time ago, he said, science is thinking God's thoughts after him. And again, I just think that's a really cool way to think about it. Then Heisenberg, um, the first gulp from the natural sciences will turn you into an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. I think that's great too. Now, I'm not talking about this Heisenberg. I'm talking about this Heisenberg. All right, just want to make sure you know which Heisenberg I'm talking about there. And the last scientist says this, Christopher Morris, the fingerprints of the divine are everywhere. The fingerprints of the divine are everywhere. There was a poll done by the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and they polled a bunch of scientists, and this is, might be surprising to you, 51% of scientists believe in some form of deity or higher power. You add to that, 31% of scientists that were polled believe in a personal God. So, you know, I'm not great at math, but I think that's 82%, right? Uh, 82% of scientists that were polled by this, uh, this organization, uh, this association, believe that there is some type of God or higher power. Now let's turn to look a little bit at what the scripture said. The scripture that Meg said, I just think is just beautiful. And... Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. You know, I came to, I got to church, I think, um, around so, close to seven, a little before seven this morning. And so the sun was just coming up, and it was a beautiful sunrise. I don't know if, if you guys got to see that this morning, but it was just beautiful. But it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And day after day, they pour forth speech that the, God's creation is speaking to us. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet, even though there are no words, you hear no speech from them, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the earth. That's the power of God's creation. That's the power of God's beauty. And from time to time, I'm sure all of us have experienced this beauty and this awesomeness of God's creation. The word goes to the end of the earth, and the heavens has got to pitch a tent for the, for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes a circuit to the others. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And there are several psalms that talk about creation and about how creation is pointing us to God. And that goes a little right along with what some of the scientists have said, right? That God's creation is pointing us to God. Jesus, uh, one of the things that he says, he's asked a question about what's the, uh, you know, he, he sums up the law, and in part of his answer is he says, love the Lord your God with all your mind. There's this belief sometimes that to be a follower of Jesus, you have to check your brain at the door, that it's an anti-intellectual religion. And the truth is, there are some churches and some denominations that would probably, maybe not necessarily agree with it like that, but they would kind of want you to agree with that. One of the great things about our church and our denomination, the United Methodist Church, is that we believe in science. And we believe that science points us to God. It doesn't take us away from God, but rather it leads us to God. And Jesus wants us to love God with every part of our being, including our minds. When I was in seminary, um, my uh, systematic theology professor, Dr. Kendall Solon, one of the things that I loved about him was that as he was lecturing, and he's one of the, the smartest people I've ever met, as he was lecturing, you could see he was worshiping God with his mind. Like he just had this delight as he was talking about these, uh, these, uh, uh, these concepts that, that were not simple. But the way that he would just talk about them and the way he would present them, he was worshiping God. And so we are called to worship God with our minds as well. We're not called to check our brains at the door when we enter the church. But God doesn't want us to do that. Christianity is not anti-intellectual. Christianity is very intellectual. 
And then one more quote I wanted to get from Jesus comes from Matthew chapter 6, 28, 29. And the context of this is he's talking about worry. And he says, why do you worry about the clothes? See the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And what, what he's, Jesus is saying here is just that the, the, flowers are, uh, the, the flowers are so pretty, they're so beautiful that they point to the divine. And so what I want to do these last few minutes of, the, of today's service is I just want to talk a little bit about creation. And uh, there is this guy, I actually mentioned him in the sermon last week, his name is Rob Bell. And he gave a presentation years ago that really enlightened me. And I'm going to share a little bit of, of what he talked about. And it really helped me to understand and to see God uh, in a different light. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so the earth is... Um, I don't know if you know this or not, the earth is moving 67,000 miles an hour. Right now, the earth that we are on is moving 67,000 miles an hour. It is also spinning at a rate of 1,000 miles an hour. So that's why we should all wear seatbelts, amen? Because we are moving, and we are moving fast, and, and the earth has a sun, or it, it's probably more accurate to say the sun has the earth, right? Uh, the earth receives 99% of the energy, of its energy from the sun. The sun converts for us 4 million tons of energy every second. And over an 11-year sun cycle, that energy output varies less than one-tenth of 1%. Just think about the precision of that. All of this at a distance of 93 million miles. We're 93 million miles away uh, from the sun. And guess what? If we were 92 million miles away from the sun, there would not be life. And if we were 94 million miles away from the sun, there would not be life. The earth is different in that than other planets and that it tilts on its axis. The earth tilts at 23.5 degrees. And so other planets, earth, right? It tilts. The other ones, I thought that was funny. Come on, people, help me out a little bit. Uh, the earth tilts at 23.5 degrees. Um, now, why does the earth tilt? Um, and if it didn't tilt, it could get tidally locked, it it's said. And what that means is that the earth would cease to rotate, and then the one side would get too much sun. And if it got too much sun, it would not be able to support life. And then the back of the sun would not get enough heat and enough sun, and it would not be able to support life. And so that tilt enables it to rotate. Uh, now, uh, part of it, the reason it tilts is because 40% of the gravitational pull comes from the sun. So the sun... Where the gravitational pull pulls that. The other 60% of the gravitational pull comes from where? The moon. That's right. Uh, the moon. Uh, no moon, no life. We need to give the moon some more credit. Amen? Uh, no moon, no life. Now, how do we get our moon? Uh, scientists believe that the moon was an asteroid or a meteor that was flying in our solar system, and it came close to Earth, and it got stuck in the orbit, and it started rotating uh, around uh, the Earth, right? And it became our moon, uh, and that created part of the tilt that we have on our Earth. Um, isn't that just crazy to think about? Hydrogen on Earth must convert, must convert to one seven thousandth point oh oh seven of its mass to helium on Earth for there to be life. If it's 0.008, no life. If it's 0.007, guess what? No life. It has to be 0.007. Our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. Uh, if our oxygen was 23, there'd be no life. If it was 19, there'd be no life which is the same, um, uh, our oceans, excuse me, our oceans are 3.4% salt, which is the same amount of salt that's found in the human bloodstream. If it was 4% salt instead of 3.4% salt, and the blo our bloodstreams had 4% instead of 3.4%, there'd be no life on earth. And so I want you to see all these numbers up here, or below me, I guess, and uh, you'll see that they're, 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 uh, it's important. This is called the science of fine-tuning. And these are just six of these variables, but there are hundreds and hundreds of these variables that have to be at the exact right spot for life to exist. 
If one dial was turned slightly different, that would create a chain reaction that would make life unsustainable on Earth. Every dial has to be turned to the precise, correct location. It's almost as if someone turned all the dials to the right spots. That's crazy to think about, right? So, does this point toward God? Does this lead us toward God or does this lead us away from God? When I see these numbers and I see that position and all these very, and again, these are just six of hundreds of these fine tunings that have to take place. And when I see how all of them have to be in the right location, what it does for me, it points toward God for me. It shows me that there is a God. Hundreds and hundreds of dials, and they have to be set to the right spot perfectly for there to be life on this planet. Back to the passage that Meg read. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. You see, our science helps our faith. It shouldn't hinder our faith. And as the bottom line for today, science doesn't disprove our faith in God. Instead, it points us toward God. All right, I got a few next steps, and, uh, and then we'll be done here for today. Here's the first one. I have moved from this or that to both. Maybe you begin to think instead of this or that to both. For whatever reason, and again, um, this gets back to what I talked about two weeks ago. You got to be there. You can't be a little bit of both, right? Begin to think both, particularly when it comes to science, when it comes to faith. Don't let um, your faith in God, your faith in Christ, keep you from uh, trusting in science. And similarly, don't let your trust in science keep you from your faith in God. There's a website that uh, my friend Chris shared with me that's called scienceforthechurch.org. If you're somebody that all this interests you and you'd like to learn a little bit more, this is a website that goes into more detail uh, than I did here today. And it's called scienceforthechurch.org. You might want to check that out. And then the last thing I want to share is this, is that look for God in creation. My, uh, my, my favorite writer, Dallas Willard, talks about God speaks to us in several ways. He speaks through us through God's Word. Uh, he speaks through us through other people. Uh, he speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. And he also says God speaks to us through God's creation. And so I want to invite you this week, maybe not today because it's 28 degrees right now, but maybe if it gets a little bit warmer to go out into God's creation and let the Creator of the universe speak to you. And may we be in awe of God's creation. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, you're an awesome God. And um, for some of us, Lord, this is a huge roadblock. We have trouble believing in this whole God thing and this whole Jesus thing because science, we believe that science disproves this. And so, Lord, for the people that think that, I just pray that they would step out, that they would step closer to science, not further away from it. Because, Lord, I believe that as we learn more, instead of science turning us away from God, it points us toward you. And, Lord, help us as people of faith to not to be scared of science. Science is not the church's enemy. It's not the Bible's enemy. Science is the church's ally, is our faith's ally. And so maybe we're willing to step out in faith. Lord, we ask that this week that you speak to us. 
and particularly this week, that you speak to us through your amazing creation. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.